Bedtime Reading The Red and the Black, Book One, Chapter One A Small Town. The small town of Verrieres might be the prettiest in the French province of Franche Comite. There are white houses on the side of the hill, and the river Dobbs flows through the town walls. When you first come to town, you hear an extremely noisy machine with many hammers. This machine makes many nails every minute. If you ask a local person, they will say, Ah, that belongs to the mayor. The mayor always looks like he is on important business, but he seems to have no imagination at all. This man appears to only think about money. This is the mayor, Mr. de Renal. The mayor owns a beautiful house up the street. Next to the house is a nice garden with nice walls. To have nice walls is a way to show your neighbors you should be respected. And Mr. de Renal got some of his walls by buying land. One piece of land belonged to old Sorel. This business was difficult because Sorel was a tough peasant. Now Sorel is called Mr. Sorel because this sale made him very rich. Many people in Verriers didn't like this deal, and public opinion is very important in a small town like Verriers. This makes life very hard. Public opinion is Almost like despotism in these small towns. Chapter 2 A Mayor. Luckily for Mr. de Renal's popularity as a mayor, the public square needed a new wall. Mr. de Renal needed three trips to Paris to raise enough money because a powerful minister said he would always oppose a wall for the square in Verrieres. The new wall is now very large, regardless of any ministers. The mayor's plans are final. When an old army surgeon said that the trees were being cut too much, the mayor replied, I like shade, and I will have the trees cut for shade. They will have no other use, and they don't bring in any money. Bringing in money. This is a very important phrase, for money always solves any argument in Verriers. One morning, Mr. de Renal was walking with his wife, Mrs. de Renal, a beautiful woman of thirty, was watching her three boys. Mr. de Renal was talking angrily about a man from Paris, Mr. Appert, who two days ago visited both the prison and the poorhouse. How can this man harm you? asked his wife. You are very honest with the poor. Mr. de Renal replied, He will blame people for something, and the liberals will write in the newspaper about it. I'll never forgive the priest for inviting him. Chapter 3 Care of the Poor The priest of Verrieres was Father Chelan. He was eighty years old, but still very strong. He had the right to visit the prison and poorhouse. Mr. Appert had come with a letter from Marquis de la Mole. A noble and rich landowner. Still, he was very worried. I'm old and well loved here, he thought. They wouldn't dare replace me. The father decided to take Mr. Appert where he wished to go. Two days later, Mr. de Renal and the master of the poorhouse, Mr. Valenot, came to speak with the priest. The priest defended himself, saying, I've lived here for fifty six years. Every day I marry young people whose grandparents I married years ago. Verriers is my family. The mayor and Mr. Valno were still angry, though. All right, then, said Father Chelan. Remove me from office. 
My land brings me money. I will survive. I am not afraid. At this time, the mayor's three sons were becoming difficult. Mr. de Renal had an idea. I've decided to hire young Sorel to tutor the children. He's almost a priest and knows Latin. I thought perhaps he was a liberal, but Father Chelan says he's a good young man. This will make me look good, he continued. Mr. Valno has two very nice new horses, but he doesn't have a tutor for his children. We must keep up our social class. This idea left Mrs. de Renal deep in thought. She was always considered beautiful but simple. Many people had tried to marry her, including Mr. Valno. Others thought her silly, but she was happy in her simple life. She thought mostly of her children, and she thought her husband was a polite man. Others did, too, when he wasn't speaking of money. And Mr. de Renal was considered the finest man in Verrieres. Chapter 4 Father and Son Mr. de Renal went the next morning to old Sorel. Old Mr. Sorel was very surprised by the mayor's offer. When Sorel replied, he recited all the words of respect he knew while he tried to think. Why would an important person want to take his good-for-nothing son into his home? The mayor had a thought. If Sorel was not excited, Mr. Valenot must have had the same idea and made the same offer. Sorel would not agree right then, however. He said he had to talk with his son. Sorel walked to the mill and called to his son. Julien did not answer. Sorel did not like his son. He was not strong like his brothers. And why was he always reading? Sorel found Julien sitting with a book in his hands. One hit from the father sent the book flying. The second struck Julien right in the face. Julien saw his favorite book in the river, ruined. Sorel's rough hand seized Julien, and the boy feared a beating. Answer me without lying, the old peasant said. Chapter 5. Striking a Bargain How do you know, Mrs. de Renal? When did you speak to her? Old Sorel shouted. I've never spoken to her, replied Julien. I've only seen her at church. There's something happening still, the old peasant said. But now I'll be rid of you. You're going to be Mr. de Renal's tutor. I don't want to be a servant. Who will I have my meals with? Sorel didn't want to miss this chance to be rid of Julien, but Julien would not eat with the servants. He'd rather run away and join the army. His goals were very high, and being like a servant would end it. When Sorel spoke to Mr. de Renal again, the subject of meals was settled. Julien would eat with Mr. and Mrs. de Renal. Sorel had an idea to get more money, though. We've had a better offer. Fear of losing his new tutor made the mayor agree to a higher pay for Julien. Having won this small battle, Sorel said, I'll send my son up to the house, and left. On his way to the house, Julien thought again about joining the church. In his youth, he admired Napoleon, but... After he saw liberals jailed, he began thinking about becoming a priest. He had learned the entire Bible in Latin with Father Chelan. Julien felt that joining the church would offer him many opportunities. Napoleon became famous building a great army, but in this time the church had more power. Now Julien was afraid to become a soldier. Mrs. de Renal was also afraid. She loved her boys dearly, and she wanted no tutor to be mean to them. Chapter 6 Boredom 
Mrs. de Renal walked out into her garden and saw a boy with fair skin standing there. He had not rung the bell. She gently said, What have you come for, dear? Julien was so impressed by her beauty that he forgot everything. Finally, he replied, I've come to tutor here. This surprised Mrs. de Renal, and she said, You know Latin, sir. Someone so well dressed had called him sir. Yes, madam, he said shyly. She became frightened. You'll be kind to them, won't you? You won't beat them. She was so gentle that Julian's voice became even softer. Never fear, madam, I promise to be kind. As he grew less shy, Julian decided he would kiss Mrs. de Renal's hand. This act might be useful later, he thought. He swore, I'll never beat your children. And he took her hand and kissed it. Before she could react, her husband entered the room. Mr. de Renal did not see anything, and he quickly gave the tutor instructions before the children could see him. Now, sir, everyone in this house will call you sir. You must dress properly. We will go to the tailor before the servants or children see you. When they returned, Julien had a new black suit. Julien thought Mrs. de Renal looked angry, and with his excitement about the new clothes and home, he decided to go to his room for a short time. Mrs. de Renal never told her husband what had happened. This was unusual for her. Mrs. de Renal rarely hid anything. When Julien returned, he met his new students and decided to show them what he could do. He gave a copy of the Bible to the oldest child, Adolf. Open it to any phrase. Read it, and I will recite the rest in Latin until you stop me. The boy read one word, and Julien began reciting as if he was speaking simple French. Mr. de Renal was so proud. He had made an excellent decision. Even the servants had come out to listen. So Julien continued. He gave the Bible to the youngest child, Stanislas Xavier, and performed again. Mr. de Renal's pride was made complete when Mr. Valenot and Mr. Charcot de Mogaron, the district leader, walked in. By evening, the whole town knew of his ability. This show made even Mr. de Renal respect Julien. No one knew that Julian admired Napoleon. Chapter 7 Choices The children loved Julian, but he thought of other things. He was a good tutor, but he felt only hatred towards the high society he joined. At one dinner, Mr. Valenot was speaking about honesty how people respected this man who doubled his fortune while running the poorhouse. Julien had to escape to the garden to hide his true feelings. Ah, what monsters, he thought. While Julien still thought Mrs. de Renal was beautiful, now he hated her because of her beauty. He rarely spoke to her, and he regretted that first day when he kissed her hand. Elisa, Mrs. de Renal's maid, had immediately fallen in love with the young tutor. Mrs. de Renal wondered why he spoke with her so much. She soon learned that Julien had so few clothes that needed Elisa's help to keep them clean and repaired. Mrs. de Renal began to pity him for what he lacked. This might seem foolish, but while Mrs. de Renal was sensitive, she had no experience of life. Until Julienne arrived, she had hardly noticed anyone but her children. Their lives were her life. The men in her life seemed only concerned with money and their social position. She saw that Julienne was different, and little by little she became attracted to him. Once she thought about how poor he was, and she wept. 
Julian saw this and asked what was wrong. Call the children, Julian, she replied, and we'll go for a walk. She took his arm closely. I want you to take some money, but please don't tell my husband. Julian stopped walking and became very angry. I am not rich, but I am not lowly. I will not hide from Mr. de Renal anything concerning money. To apologize, she took Julian and the boys to the bookstore in town, even though the owner was known to be a liberal. She purchased books for the children that she knew Julian wanted. Julian was only thinking about the number of books in the store. He didn't think once about Mrs. de Renal, only about how he could read some of those books. He began planning a way to get Mr. de Renal to buy some. He thought of a plan that would bring him the books. And at the same time, convinced Mr. de Renal that he too feared what the liberals might say. This small battle was won easily, as were many others. How he hated these rich people! What monsters and what fools! He always privately disagreed with them, but many times he didn't understand their political beliefs. Mrs. de Renal, however, Thought more and more of Julian. Chapter 8 Events Mrs. de Renal's happiness lessened when she thought of her maid Elisa. The girl had inherited some money and confessed to Father Chelan that she wanted to marry Julian. The priest was delighted for his friend Julian and was surprised when the tutor refused. Be careful, the priest said, of what you desire. I see strong ambition in you. Seeking fortune is not horrible for common people, but as a member of the church, it is a path to hell. For the first time in his life, Julian knew someone cared for him. Yet Julian was angry with himself. Father Chelan thinks I wouldn't make a good priest. He's the one with whom I must be dishonest. But I failed, he thought. Mrs. de Renal noticed Elisa's new fortune did not make her happier, and she asked her maid why. At last, Elisa talked to her about marriage. For the next few days, Mrs. de Renal felt ill. She thought always of Julien and Elisa's happy new life. She even hated Elisa. She soon saw that Elisa was more troubled than before. Elisa confessed that Julien had refused her. Mrs. de Renal immediately felt better, but she wanted to try to convince Julien herself. The next day she spent an hour trying to convince Julien. He refused again and again, and Mrs. de Renal's heart filled with happiness. She suddenly felt ill again. When recovered in her room, she asked herself at last, Could I be in love with Julien? When spring came, the family went to the countryside. Mrs. de Renal's happiness only increased, and she began changing her dresses three times a day. She spoke with Julien every day, although always on harmless topics. Soon she brought her cousin, Mrs. Durville, to the house. Julien felt happy as well. He was away from the public. And when Mr. de Renal was away, he could read his books without fear. Napoleon said things about women, and Julian now thought the same things boys of his age had thought long before. One evening, Julian was talking with the two young women in the garden, and he accidentally touched the back of Mrs. de Renal's hand. She moved it away. Julian decided it was his duty to touch the hand again and hold it. This idea of duty took away all the pleasure from his heart. Chapter 9 An Evening in the Country. The next day, when he saw Mrs. de Renal, he looked at her as if she were an enemy he was going to have to fight. This very different look alarmed Mrs. de Renal greatly. 
When he saw her later, he thought of glory and decided he must hold her hand that evening. That night was dark, which would make his job easier. When they sat in the garden, he was full of fear. Every minute was like an hour, until the clock struck ten o'clock. At last he grasped her hand. She pulled back immediately, and surprising himself, he reached and held on to it. She tried to pull back once again, but he held tightly. Her hand stayed in his. Happiness filled him, not that he was in love, but that his fear was over. His voice was loud and even. Mrs. de Renal's voice, however, showed so much feeling that her friend Mrs. Durville thought she was ill. Mrs. Durville said that they should go inside. Julienne sensed the danger. If she goes inside now, I will be back in the same terrible situation, he thought. I have held this hand for too short a time for this to be a victory. When Mrs. Durville repeated her suggestion, Julien squeezed the hand he held firmly. Mrs. de Renal had started to get up, but sat down again. She said, I do feel a little ill, but the fresh air is helping. These words settled Julien's worries. When he woke the next day, he had no thoughts of Mrs. de Renal. He only thought that he had done his duty, his heroic duty. He decided to spend the morning reading about the deeds of his hero, Napoleon. He did not even see the children. Julien came downstairs, but instead of a romantic look from Mrs. de Renal, he found the angry face of Mr. de Renal. Mr. de Renal yelled for some time. He did not fire Julien right then, only because he feared Mr. Valenot would hire him right away. Julien's anger was so great that even Mrs. Durville tried to calm him. He replied with the coldest look. This was a look that desired revenge upon the higher class. Such moments inspire people like Robespierre and his Jacobins, who led the French Revolution. Mrs. de Renal and Mrs. Durville tried to cheer him up when they went for a walk. My husband won't join us, Mrs. de Renal said. He and his servants will be filling the beds with new hay. Julien changed color and brought Mrs. de Renal away. Please save my life, he said. In my bed I have a picture hidden. Only you can go right now and take a little box out from inside my bed. I beg you, please don't look at this picture. She left immediately and went to his room. Her husband was just next door. She quickly searched his bed and found the box. Her heart dropped because she believed that inside was a picture of another woman. Julian's in love, and I've got the picture of the woman right here, she thought. She returned, and Julian took the box without a word. He ran to his room where he immediately burned the box. But Mrs. de Renal was mistaken. A picture of Napoleon. If discovered, this would end my reputation, and that is all I have, he thought. When he returned, he kissed Mrs. de Renal's hand with more honesty than he had ever shown. But she pushed him away with jealous anger. All Julian saw at that point was a rich woman, nothing else. Chapter 10 A Good Heart and a Small Fortune Julian's anger that day reached even Mr. de Renal. He told Mr. de Renal how well the students were learning. How could Mr. de Renal say such awful things to him? Then he said, I know where to go, sir, when I leave your house. Mr. de Renal knew what this meant. Mr. Valenot had made Julien an offer. I will give you more money then. Julien's anger disappeared. This man is an animal, he thought. That's the best apology his small mind can think of. 
Later, he asked Mr. de Renal for the day off so he could visit Father Chelan. On his way to Verrieres, Julien stopped in the woods. He thought about the day. He had lived through danger and won more money, two victories in one day. He saw a hawk through the trees, and he watched it fly. It was powerful and alone. He wanted to be like the bird. Napoleon was like that. Could Julien become that way? Chapter 11 In the Evening Julien returned that evening. The garden was very dark. He tried to take Mrs. de Renal's hand, but she refused. Just then Mr. de Renal came out. The mayor was talking about politics. Julien thought he should take Mrs. de Renal's hand while Mr. de Renal was sitting nearby. She let him and he began kissing her hand all over. Mrs. de Renal felt weak. Goodness, she said to herself. Could I be in love? I'm married, and I've fallen in love. But I've never felt this way with my husband. For one moment, Julien forgot ambition and only thought of Mrs. de Renal's beauty. He did not feel love, though. Thinking about Napoleon's victories gave him an idea. I've won a battle, he said to himself, and I must continue and hurt this man's pride. I will ask for three days off to see my friend Fouquet. That night Mrs. de Renal could not sleep. She felt alive, but then she remembered that it was a sin to love a man who wasn't her husband. Her pure love was now something ugly, and she felt very guilty. Her worries made her ill, and she decided she would be cold to Julien next time. Chapter 12 A Journey Julien prepared to leave the next morning. Mrs. de Renal came outside to see him, but he was surprised by her cold manner. He thought she wanted to remind him of his low position in society, and this hurt his pride. The pain and anger that came to Julien's face made Mrs. de Renal want to cry, and she soon went to bed. While Mrs. de Renal wept, Julien enjoyed the countryside. Far away from any people, Julien felt free. After some time he came to the valley where his friend Fouquet, the wood merchant, lived alone. Even with his friend Fouquet, he would hide his true feelings. Julien told Fouquet some of what had happened. You can stay here with me and be my partner, Fouquet suggested. We can make a lot of money selling wood. This offer did not make Julien happy. He could take the money and later he could become a priest or a soldier. The money would help him if he had troubles. But if I work here, I'll lose seven or eight years of my youth, he thought. By the age of twenty-eight, Napoleon had done many great things. Could he still do great things if he started so late? Julien refused Fouquet's offer, and Fouquet was confused. I'll make you a partner. Why do you still want to return? Mr. de Renal hates you, he said. Still, Julien refused. Julien left Fouquet's house and traveled through the mountains. He was not peaceful now, though. Fouquet's offer had troubled him. He had to choose between an easy life and his heroic dream. These troubles made Julien doubt his ability to be a great man. Chapter 13 New Shoes Julien had not thought about Mrs. de Renal for three days. She treats me like a worker's son, he thought, but she's so beautiful. Mrs. Durville had been watching her friend, Mrs. de Renal, usually dressed plainly, but she bought new shoes from Paris, and Elisa made her a new dress. Mrs. Durville knew that her friend was in love. 
Mrs. de Renal asked Julien about his trip. She was very nervous, but finally she asked, Will you leave us to teach somewhere else? When she spoke, Julien knew too, She's in love with me, he said to himself, but only right now. Soon her pride will return. It will be hard to leave, but it might be necessary, he said. When the group sat in the garden that night, Julienne took her hand again and softly kissed it many times. After some time, he forgot about her hand and let it go. Mrs. de Renal was so afraid of losing him that she reached out and took his hand. This surprised Julienne so much that he decided, I must become this woman's lover. This idea was another battle for Julienne. Not an act of love. He wanted another victory. She whispered, Will you leave us? I must leave because I love you, he said, and it's a sin for a young priest. That night was very different for the two. Mrs. de Renal was happier than ever before. A woman who falls in love early gets used to love's changes, but this innocent woman didn't know anything about love. Chapter 14 A Pair of English Scissors Fouquet's offer had taken all Julien's pleasure away. He could not decide how to begin. He wrote a very detailed plan. First, he must give her a kiss. He was foolish, though. Mr. de Renal almost caught him, and Mrs. de Renal was shocked. This man is very smart but he does not know anything about women, she thought. Could it be that he has never made love? After lunch, Mrs. de Renal had a visit from Mr. de Mogueron. She was working on her sewing when Julien touched her foot with his. She dropped her sewing and scissors to hide his action. You have to be careful, Mrs. de Renal said. Julien felt foolish, so he decided to go to Verrieres to visit the priest. Father Chelan had been dismissed from his office, and a priest named Maslon had replaced him. Julien helped the old priest move. Later he wrote a letter to Fouquet, saying that this injustice showed him that the church might not be a good place. This would give him a way out of his plans if he decided on the easy life. Chapter 15 The Call of the Cock The next day they sat in the garden again. Immediately Julien put his lips to Mrs. de Renal's ear and said, Madam, tonight I will come to your room at two o'clock in the morning. I have something to say to you. Her reply was short and angry. How dare you! Julien left to say something to the children, and when he returned, he sat away from Mrs. de Renal. When two o'clock came, Julien was very nervous, but he decided to go to her room. He listened at Mr. de Renal's room and heard him sleeping. Then he turned and opened Mrs. de Renal's door. A light was on. Mrs. de Renal jumped out of bed and cried, You horrible person! Julien fell to his knees and cried. She continued to yell at him. Later, when Julien left, he had nothing left to desire. But even as he made love to Mrs. de Renal, he was still playing a role. He tried to play an experienced lover, and he always thought of duty. Because of these thoughts, he could not enjoy what happened. Is this all there is to being loved? he asked himself. Did I play my part properly? Chapter 16 The Day After The next morning, Julien acted calmly. He only looked at Mrs. de Renal once. At first, Mrs. de Renal thought this was good. 
Later, he didn't look at her again, and she began to worry. Doesn't he love me? she wondered. She touched his hand when they walked to the garden, and he gave her a loving look. This calmed her fears, but did not end them. She wanted to be alone with him. She wanted him to come to her room again. Julia knew his duty, and at one o'clock he went to her room. That day he had greater happiness in love because he thought less of his role. His happiness made Mrs. d e r i n a l less afraid and even happier. In a few days, Julian was head over heels in love with Mrs. d e r i n a l His love still came from ambition, but he had almost forgotten the idea of the role he had to play. Mrs. d e r i n a l could not believe this new love's happiness. She never knew such joy existed. She only wished she could have married Julian instead of Mr. d e r i n a l Soon Mrs. Derville went home. Mrs. d e r i n a l was sad, but now she and Julian were alone almost all day. This was good for Julian because when he was alone he thought of Fouquet's offer. Chapter 17 First Assistant One day Julian was sitting alone with Mrs. d e r i n a l He was thinking about the difficulty of taking on a profession. Ah, he said, Napoleon was great for the young men of France. What will we do without him? He saw the cold look on her face. He had forgotten she was rich. Quickly, he said that he had heard Fouquet say those words. Well, then don't talk to people like that any more, she said. This made Julian calmer and more careful. Mrs. d e r i n a l was surprised by his words. Men like Mr. d e r i n a l said that too much education for the lower class might turn them into revolutionaries. Julian began asking Mrs. d e r i n a l questions about society. He learned much from her about politics in France and in Verrieres. This was very interesting to him. It was even more interesting than the books Fouquet gave him. His lover's beauty kept him from thinking about his ambition. One day, when they sat with the children, Mrs. d e r i n a l looked into Julian's eyes. She saw how smart he was. She thought he would become a great man some day. Chapter 18 A King in Verrieres On September 3rd, an officer rode into town. He woke the whole town to tell them the king would come the next Sunday. The officer said the town needed an honor guard to meet the king. A message was sent to the countryside, and Mr. d e r i n a l came into town. He needed to choose a leader for the honor guard. There was much work to be done. Mrs. d e r i n a l was very busy. She decided she wanted to see Julian in different clothes. He always wore his black suit. She talked to the district leader, Mr. de m o g u e r o n and got Julian a place in the honor guard. Mr. v a l i n o also gave Julian a great horse to use. Mr. v a l i n o hated Julian, but he liked Mrs. d e r i n a l very much. The king would also visit a nearby church, so many priests needed to be there. Father Maslon, the new town priest, did not want Father Chelan to be there. Father Chelan was a Jansenist, but most powerful members of the church were Jesuits. Mr. de Renal knew Father Chelan must be there, though. The king was bringing Marquis de la Mole. And the Marquis knew Father Chelan very well. Finally, Father Maslon agreed. Father Chelan asked Julien to be his assistant for that night. On Sunday, the honor guard rode through town to meet the king. Many people in town were very angry. This peasant was in the honor guard, and many rich men were not. Julien was the happiest of men, though. 
he felt like he was one of Napoleon's soldiers. Only one person was happier. She watched him in his new sky-blue clothes and thought he was most handsome. After the king arrived, Julien quickly went home. Sadly, he changed into his religious clothes and went to the church. Father Chelan and Julien then left to find the young bishop of Agde, who was Marquis de la Mole's nephew. Julien walked through the beautiful church and finally found a young man. This is the bishop? This man is only seven or eight years older than me, Julien thought. That night the church was beautiful, and the church service was very good. Even the king bowed when the bishop spoke. Julien did not think about Napoleon or army glory any more. The bishop was young, but very rich and powerful. Julien realized that the church was the place to find real power. Chapter 19 Thinking Brings Suffering A week after the king's visit, the town was still talking about Julien's place in the honor guard. The people were still very angry at Julien and at Mrs. de Renal, too. Why did she do it? they asked. Because Julien is so handsome? was the answer. After they returned to the countryside, Mrs. de Renal's youngest son, Stanislaus, became very ill. Mrs. de Renal blamed herself. This is punishment from God, she thought. Julien tried to calm her, but failed. Go away, she said one day. By God, leave this house. God is punishing Stanislaus for my crime. Julien feared she would confess to Mr. de Renal. So, this is adultery, he thought. Could it be that the lying priests are right? Those men have many sins, so do they know the truth about sin? Julien tried to think of a plan. I love her, but how can I help her? If I leave her, she might tell her husband everything and ruin herself. If you want me to leave, I will, he said. But if you tell your husband, then I cannot return. Finally, Stanislaus's fever broke, but Mrs. de Renal was not happy. I am going to hell, she said. I know it. If only you were Stanislaus's father, then it would not be a sin to love you. I cannot stop loving you, though. Elisa went to Verrieres and met Mr. Valenod. Mr. Valenod was talking about Julien, whom he hated. Miss Elisa then told him what she knew about Julien. Mr. Valenod had tried to marry Mrs. de Renal, but she refused. Now she had taken this poor worker's son as a lover. I'm sure this is the reason he refused to marry me, Elisa said. That night Mr. de Renal received a long anonymous letter on blue paper with his newspaper. The letter told him everything that had happened in his house. As he read the letter, he looked at Julien many times. Chapter 20 Anonymous Letters We cannot see each other tonight, Julien said to Mrs. de Renal. Your husband might know something about us. I think the letter he was reading was an anonymous one. The next morning, the cook gave Julien a letter. The letter had many tears on the paper. You didn't want to see me? Don't you love me? If you never loved me, you can tell everyone. I don't care who knows. I've only begun to live since I've loved you. Was there really an anonymous letter? I wanted to discuss that, you beast. Tomorrow... I'll tell my husband I've received an anonymous letter, too. We will not see each other for a month, maybe. You must write this letter exactly. Anonymous letter. Dear madam, I know what you've been doing, and so does your husband. You must stay away from the peasant. When you finish writing the letter, give it to me. Then go for a walk. If you see a white flag in my window, the plan is good. If you love me, 
show me before you leave. If we are separated forever, I won't truly live anymore. It is a small price to pay for the happiness I felt in your arms. Chapter 21 Discussion with a Master When Julian gave the new letter to Mrs. de Renal, she was very calm. If this goes wrong, I'll lose everything, she said. Take this box of money and hide it in the mountains. This was the worst time in Mr. de Renal's life. He tried to guess who wrote the letter. Besides his wife, He only had ten friends. All of them envy me, he thought, especially Mr. Valnau. Can it be that I have no friends to ask for advice? Oh, Falcoz! Falcoz was his childhood friend, but he was not a noble. Ten years ago, Falcoz started a newspaper, but the government took away his license. He asked his old friend for help, but Mr. de Renal refused. Now, Mr. de Renal thought, I have money and power, but still I need him. What can I do? he thought. If I surprise them in bed, I can kill them both. The law is on my side, and I won't go to jail. Mr. de Renal looked at his knife, but the thought of blood frightened him. I can throw them out of my house, but then they'll go to Paris. She'll inherit her aunt's money, and then I'll look like a fool. All my friends and verriers will laugh. If only she were dead. No one would laugh at me then. Mrs. de Renal knew her plan had only one chance. She gave her husband the letter and said, A man gave me this horrible letter today. I demand you send this Mr. Sorel away right now. Mr. de Renal read the letter. This letter was also on blue paper. And Mr. de Renal was both tired and angry. You must dismiss Julian, his wife said. He's only a worker's son, and he'll find another job. Mr. Valenau or Mr. de Mangiron might hire him, for example. You're very stupid, Mr. de Renal yelled. Women don't understand anything. Mr. de Renal yelled for a long time. But Mrs. de Renal was calm. She was only thinking of Julien. She wanted him to be proud of her. Send him away for a month. He can stay with his friend in the woods, she said. I've never thought he was a good person since he refused to marry Elisa. He would get a fortune because she sometimes meets Mr. Valenau secretly. This was surprising. Ah, said Mr. de Renal. This is interesting. Mrs. de Renal continued. Mr. Valenau even sent me letters before. Now Mr. de Renal was even angrier. Show me these letters. Where are they? Mr. de Renal found the old letters and made a discovery. These letters are on the same paper as the second anonymous letter. He wanted to go and talk to Mr. Valenau right away, but Mrs. de Renal calmed him down. Many people in town envy you, she said. If you start this new trouble, they will laugh at you. Mr. de Renal agreed, so he decided not to talk to Mr. Valenau or Elisa right away. At dinner, Mr. de Renal said to Julien, You may go to Verrielles for a week. When Mr. de Renal left, Mrs. de Renal told Julien what she had done. Mrs. de Renal still wanted to see him that night, but Julian thought it was not wise. I think you don't care about me, she said. I'm just worried I will miss you very much, he replied. Chapter 22 Behavior in 1830 Many rich liberals had offered Father Chelan a home when he had to leave the church, but the priest refused. His two rented rooms were full of books. To help his friend, Julien built him a bookcase. I thought you had turned bad, the priest said happily. I was wrong. Three days later, the district leader, Mr. de Mogueron, came to visit Julien. Mr. de Mogueron 
talked for more than an hour about nothing. Finally, he asked Julien to work for a town official and teach his children. The official would give him more money than Mr. de Renal. Julien's reply was perfect. He spoke for a long time and gave respect to Mr. de Renal, devotion to the town of Verrieres, and thanks to the district leader. Mr. de Mogueron tried to get a real answer, but Julien was enjoying his practice. Not even a minister has used more words to say less. Mr. de Mogueron left and Julien burst into laughter. He wrote a nine page letter to Mr. de Renal, telling him everything except who made the offer. Mr. de Renal, of course, thought it was Mr. Valenod. The next day, Mr. Valenod invited Julien to dinner. Mr. Valenod was a big man and he wore lots of gold jewelry. Julien met Mrs. Valenod, who had a face like a man and wore lots of makeup. He saw the house, and Mr. Valenod told him the price of everything. Julien hated everything and everyone he saw. At dinner, a factory owner asked him if he really knew the entire Bible in Latin. A Bible was brought to him, and he performed perfectly. By the end of dinner, many of the wealthy liberals liked him, and he had four more invitations to dinner. Dinner made Julien realize that life with Mr. de Renal was not so bad. Mr. de Renal did not make money from the poorhouse, and Mr. de Renal would never tell his guests the price of the wine they drank. Mr. de Renal and the children came to town a few days later. The children missed Julien terribly. They wanted him to come back to the house. While they were talking, Mr. de Renal walked in. He was vain, and he was angry to see his family so happy without him. Mr. Valenot, though, was busy with politics. He had a lot of trouble at the poorhouse since Mr. Appert came and Father Chillon was fired. He got support from the vicar general, Mr. de Frilair, but now Mr. de Frilair sent him strange instructions. Now his wife, who owned the house, wanted Julien to teach her children. He knew he would have trouble soon with his old protector, Mr. de Renal. Chapter 23 The Problems of a Politician. Two days later, the family was back in Verrieres. Julien noticed Mrs. de Renal was keeping a secret from him. She stopped talking to her husband whenever Julien came near. Julien wondered if she had found a new lover. In these conversations, there was talk of a large house owned by the town. Julien wondered what this meant. He soon saw a poster on a wall. The next day, at two o'clock, the house would be for sale. The time was very short. How would all the interested people find out? Julian went to the house for sale and heard two people talking. They said that Father Maslon had promised it to a friend for half of its real worth. When Mr. de Renal refused, he was called to the bishop's palace by the vicar general, Mr. de Frelair. Julian did not miss the sale. He listened to others talk about the low price. One man wanted to offer a higher price. His friend warned him, It won't do any good. Also, you'll make enemies of Father Maslon, Mr. Valneau, the bishop, and the horrible man, de Frelair. Let's stop talking, though. The mayor's spy is here. Julien wanted to punish the man, but the sales time was finished. The salesman gave the house to Mr. de St. Gerard for nine years. The mayor left, and people started talking. The mayor couldn't stop this? Well, at least he doesn't steal, one said. Another replied, Doesn't steal? He will whenever someone tells him. Oh, but there's young Sorel over there. Let's go. Julien was angry when he went home. Mrs. de Renal was very sad. 
Did you come from the sale? Yes, madam, and people thought I was the mayor's spy. Mr. de Renal came in, and he was also very sad. No one spoke at all during dinner. Mr. de Renal told Julienne to follow the children to the house in the country. On the trip, Mrs. de Renal tried to comfort her husband. You should be used to it, my dear. The whole family was quiet that evening. Then one of the children shouted excitedly, Someone's at the door! A servant brought a very handsome man into the room. Sir, I am Mr. Geronimo. Here is a letter for you from Mr. Bouvasis at the embassy in Naples. I left only nine days ago, he said cheerfully. To Mrs. de Renal, he said, Mr. Bouvasis, your cousin, tells me you know Italian. The Italian man's good humor changed the evening from a sad one into a cheerful one. Mrs. de Renal insisted on giving him dinner. She wanted to make Julian forget that people thought he was a spy. Mr. Geronimo was a famous singer. He was from a good family and very friendly. It was very rare for French people to be both. After supper, he told delightful stories. At one o'clock in the morning, the children were still asking for more stories. The next morning, Mr. and Mrs. de Renal gave Mr. Geronimo the papers he needed to go to Paris. One thing astonished Julien. The weeks alone in Verrieres were a very happy time. He could read, write, and think. Could happiness be this easy? I would not have to work hard. I could marry Elisa or become Fouquet's partner. Mrs. de Renal sometimes thought of the happiness that she would feel if she were suddenly not married to Mr. de Renal. She could marry Julien. He loved her sons more than their own father did. She imagined living in Paris. All of them would be happy. The whole town was not happy, though. They were angry that Julien still lived in Mr. de Renal's home. Mr. Valneau had found Elisa a job at another house. She then went to both Father Chillon and the new priest and confessed. She told them both about Julien's love for Mrs. de Renal. Father Chillon called for Julien. I'm not asking questions. I demand that in three days you leave for the school in Besançon or to your friend Fouquet's house, since he'll give you a job. You must go and not return to Verrieres in less than a year. Mrs. de Renal knew Julien had to leave, but she was very worried. He'll forget me when he leaves, she thought. Someone will love him, and he'll love back. Julien said, I will leave if they want me to, but three days after I leave, I will come back to visit you in the night. Mrs. de Renal knew then that Julien cared for her. Mr. de Renal had received another letter, and he decided to challenge Mr. Valenot to a duel. It took Mrs. de Renal many hours to change his mind. After a long time, she convinced him the best answer was to pay for Julien to go to the school in Besançon. Finally, Mr. de Renal agreed. Three days later, Julien came to Mrs. de Renal's room at night. Like he had promised. He was excited, but Mrs. de Renal could only think one thought I am seeing him for the last time. Her body was cold, and she could not return Julien's kisses. When Julien left for Besançon, he could see the church in Verrieres for a long way. He looked back many times. Chapter 24 a capital city. At last Julien saw the great black walls of Besançon. How different it would be, he thought, if I came to this city as a soldier instead of as a church student. He thought of history as he walked around the city. Fouquet had given him a plain suit, and he was wearing it. He stopped in front of a large café. He was very nervous, but he finally entered. The room was full of smoke. 
he was too shy to ask anyone for a cup of coffee. The girl behind the bar noticed the shy, handsome man and called to him. Julien walked over like a soldier going into battle and dropped his bag on the floor. He decided he needed to be brave, so he said, Madame, this is the first time in my life I've come to Besançon. I'd like some bread and a cup of coffee. I can pay. Sit here near me, she said. And she showed off her figure. Julien sat down and she gave him a piece of bread. He paused and compared this beautiful girl to Mrs. de Renal. What's your name? he asked. Amanda Binet. I'm called Julien Sorel. I have no friends or family here. Oh, I understand, she said happily. You're here to study law. No, he replied. I'm being sent to the school. Amanda was disappointed and went to get the coffee. When Amanda came back, Julian asked her to hold his normal clothes. I can't take them now, but you can send them to me, she said. Julian looked into her eyes and said suddenly, I feel I love you, Amanda. Just then her boyfriend came into the cafe. You have to go right now, she said. But pay before you go. Julian stood outside the cafe for an hour. He had just come to Bay Sanson and he already felt like a failure. He found another inn and put his extra clothes there. He was afraid to go to the school. Julian thought it would be like a prison. Chapter 25 The School Julien found the school, but he was nervous again. He waited ten minutes to knock on the door. He told a frightening man he wanted to see Mr. Perard, the master of the school. They went up to a simple room. A poorly dressed man was writing there. Then the man looked at him with terrible eyes. Your name? he said. Julien Sorel. You're very late. Julien could not look at the eyes again, and he fell to the ground. When Julien woke up, the man said, You are recommended to me by Father Chelan. He was the best priest in the area, and my friend for thirty years. Ah, so you are Mr. Pirard, Julien said. Yes, Father Chelan wrote me a short letter about you. He wrote, I am sending you Julien Sorel. He is very smart and has a good memory, but I don't know if his faith is true. I ask that you let Julien come to school here. He can take any test you want. I have taught him what I could. Do you speak Latin? Father Perard asked him in Latin. Julien answered him in Latin, and they talked for a long time. Father Perard questioned him about religion and was surprised by Julien's knowledge of the Bible. He knew nothing about the church father's writings, though. Julian's mind was very good, and Father Perard decided to allow him to attend the school. I don't often allow people to attend my school, but Father Chillon has worked for many years teaching you. This is his reward, Father Perard said. While you're here, do not join any secret groups, and be careful with your money. He called the other man and said, Take Julian Sorel to room 103. It was a great honor to get a private room. Julian was also happy with the view. He could see the river Dobbs. The day had been very difficult, and Julian fell asleep right away. When he woke up in the morning, he was lying on the floor. Chapter 26 the world, or what the rich man lacks. Julien was already late. An assistant master scolded him. Instead of becoming angry with the assistant, Julien said in Latin, I have sinned, I confess the error of my ways. This was a success, and many students admired Julien. People were interested in him, but he did not talk to them. He had decided that the other students were his enemies. 
The most dangerous enemy was Father Perard. A few days later, Julian had to choose a confessor. A confessor was someone the students talked to about their sins. He thought he was smart to choose Father Perard, the master of the school. Another student told him he was wrong. Julian should have chosen Father Castaneda, a Jesuit. Some people don't trust Father Perard, and Father Castaneda is Father Perard's enemy. The other students were poor, simple peasants. Julian thought he was better than all of them. These people just wanted an easy job and a good meal. Being a town priest was easier than working on a farm. Julian didn't believe the things he learned in class, but he had nothing else to do, so he studied very hard. He thought everyone had forgotten him, but Father Perard had secretly read some letters sent to Julian from a woman. Even though the language was proper, he knew the woman loved Julian. Father Perard burnt every letter. Fouquet came to visit Julian. The friends talked for a long time. After a while, Fouquet told his friend that Mrs. de Renal had become very religious. She travels to churches, too, Fouquet said. She often goes to Dijon and Besançon. She comes to Besançon? Julien asked, turning red. Fouquet looked at his friend strangely. Julien soon realized that the other students disliked him, and he discovered the reason. Julien always tried to be the best student in his class, and he often was. This made him many enemies. Julien found that the content of the classes was not the most important thing. The real learning was only to catch people like him. How foolish I was, he said. Every movement and every choice either made him enemies or friends. Father Perard was no help to him, either. Father Perard only spoke to Julien in confession. One day Julien was called to Father Perard's office. Father Perard was very angry, and he showed Julien a playing card. On the card was written, Amanda Binet at the Café de la Giraffe. Before eight o'clock, say you are my cousin. What does this mean? yelled Father Perard. Julien was very calm. When I came here, Father Chelan warned me that many people were not honest. This woman offered to help me if people tried to hurt me here. I will check if this is true, Father Perard replied. Julien was angry with himself. I had been very stupid, he thought. If I had gone to see Amanda, they would have known and used it against me. Later, he was called again. Chapter 27 First Experience of Life We will not give many details about this time in Julien's life. We have them, of course, but we don't want to make the story so sad. Julien did not make friends with his fellow students. He would not be happy even if he did. The students only cared about stupid things like food, and they did bad things all the time. Julien knew now that difference brings hatred. He tried to make friends with a faithful student, but soon the student refused him. It's every man for himself. God might strike you down, and I don't want to be near you, he said. When the students did not talk about food, they talked about the life of a working priest. One day they were talking about the way the Pope chooses people for different positions. Julian decided to use his knowledge of the Pope. He astonished them, but it was another failure. His ability became a new crime against him. His failure was the same as Father Chillon's failure. They both thought it best to talk honestly. But if people do not like you, this is a crime. The other students gave him a new nickname, Martin Luther. Chapter 28 A Procession It was no use. Julien could not get anyone to like him. 
he was too different. And why, he said to himself, do the teachers not appreciate me? Only one liked that Julien seemed ready to believe anything. This was Father Chaz Bernard, who also worked at the cathedral. Some days Father Chaz Bernard would walk with Julien in the garden. The priest only talked about the decorations in the cathedral. They were very beautiful and very expensive. Many were made of gold. What does he want from me? Julien thought. During class one day, Father Perard called Julien to his office. Tomorrow there is a feast. Father Chaz Bernard needs your help to decorate the cathedral. Go and help him, he said. Decoration began at five o'clock in the morning. It was long and difficult work. Several workers also helped, but they were nervous about the highest decorations. Julien climbed the tall ladders easily, and he jumped from one to another. They finished quickly. Excellent. I will tell the bishop, Father Chaz Bernard said. When the procession began, Julien started to follow the bishop. Wait, Father Chaz Bernard said. We have to watch for thieves while the cathedral is empty. The procession returned, and Julien admired its beauty. He looked around and saw two very beautiful women sitting to the side. Julien walked closer to look at them. When he got close, one turned to look at him. The woman almost fell over. Julien had to run to help the two women stand up. Immediately he knew who they were. It was Mrs. de Renal and Mrs. Durville. Mrs. Durville yelled at him. Go away. She can't see you again. She was happy before she saw you. Julien was so weak that Father Chaz Bernard decided to let him rest. When the bishop came to thank Father Chaz Bernard and Julien, Julien could not even stand. Chapter 29 First Promotion Julien had not recovered from the shock of seeing Mrs. de Renal when Father Perard called for him. Father Chaz Bernard has sent a letter about you. I am happy with your behavior. You have a kind heart and an excellent mind, and I don't want it to be wasted. I have been here fifteen years, but I will soon be gone. Before I leave, I want to do something for you. I am making you the Bible teacher. Julien was so happy he kissed Father Perard's hand. Well, I like you, boy, the priest said. Your work will be hard. Something about you makes people envious. Julien had not heard a friendly voice for a long time, and when he heard this, he cried. The promotion was good for Julien. He hated to eat with the other students, and now he could eat alone. He also could walk in the garden alone. His pride had made him many enemies, but now it seemed proper. Soon nobody called him Martin Luther. It was hunting season, and Fouquet sent a deer and a pig to the school. Fouquet said it was from Julien's family. The other students now thought Julien's family was rich, so they paid him even more respect. Soon it was time for examinations. On the first day, Vicar General de Ferler's men were angry that they were giving first place to Father Perard's favorite student, Julien. On the next day, one examiner asked Julien about the books of Horace and other ancient writers. Julien had memorized many lines from Horace. Julien forgot where he was and talked about Horace for twenty minutes until the examiner became angry. The examiner yelled at him for spending so much time reading that kind of book. You are right, Julien answered. I am a fool. Everyone knew it was a dirty trick, but Father de Ferler wanted to hurt his enemy, Father Perard. Father de Ferler put Julien in 198th place. 
A few weeks later, Julien received a letter from Paris. The letter was signed Paul Sorel. Paul said he was a relative and gave Julien a lot of money. The letter told him to continue to study good Latin writers like Horace. Mrs. de Renal sent it, Julien thought. She doesn't want me to be sad. Julien was very wrong, however. While working for the bishop, Father de Frelaire had made himself very wealthy. In time, he came to own half of a piece of land. The other half was owned by Marquis de la Mole. The Marquis was angry that this priest would challenge him, so they had a great lawsuit. The Marquis wrote Father Chelan for help, and Father Chelan told him to write to Father Perard. Although they never met each other, the powerful Marquis and the Father Perard became friends. Father Perard worked hard on the lawsuit, but he would never accept any money. Marquis de la Mole decided to send some money to Father Perard's favorite student instead. One day Father Perard received another letter. Marquis de la Mole knew Father Perard would soon be fired, and the Marquis offered Father Perard a position as priest in a wealthy part of Paris. It was a wonderful job offer. Father Perard wrote a very long, respectful letter to the bishop. He told the bishop everything that was done to him at the school. He got Julien out of bed and gave him the letter. Take this to the bishop, he said, but be careful with your words. I am quitting this job. Julien dressed and went to the bishop's palace. A priest took the letter and read it. Julien realized this priest was Father de Frelaire. The priest was dressed very nicely, but he had a dishonest face. The bishop entered the room, and Julien bowed. The terrible Father Perard is finally leaving us, Father de Frelaire said. I don't think you can find a better man, the bishop replied. Send in that student. I want to talk to him. Before asking about Father Perard, the bishop asked Julien questions about his studies. The bishop was very surprised by Julien's knowledge, and he asked Julien about Virgil, Horace and Cicero, three ancient writers. Julien's knowledge impressed the bishop again. The bishop said, I didn't expect to find such a smart man as a student. There are smarter students than me, Julien replied. I was 198th in the examinations. I see. You are Father Perard's boy, then, the bishop laughed. I can see you'll go far. They talked for a long time more and the bishop noticed Julien had never heard of Tacitus, another writer. "'You've given me a wonderful evening,' the bishop said, "'and I want to give you a gift. "'It may not be religious, but please take this set of books by Tacitus.' Julien returned to the school. Every student knew about his conversation with the bishop. They all wanted to talk to him, even Father Castaneda, who hated Julien. Father Perard left the school, and people learned of his position in Paris. They thought he had played the game of politics very well, but Father Perard still loved the school. Chapter 30 A Man of Ambition Marquis de la Mole welcomed Father Perard in a friendly way. He was busy with politics, and he was trying to become a duke. I have no time to deal with my important business. Finding good help in Paris is very hard. Will you be my secretary? I'll pay you a great salary. Father Perard said, No, thank you. I do know someone, though. He was a student of mine, and he is very smart. What is his background? Marquis de la Mole asked. They say he is a worker's son. But I'm not sure. He received an anonymous letter giving him some money. Oh, the Marquis replied. You mean Julian Sorel? The priest was astonished. How do you know his name? It's not important. I will offer him the job right away. Good, but although his family is of low class, he has a lot of pride. 
If you treat him like a servant, he'll be useless, the priest warned. Then I will make him my son's friend, was the Marquis's answer. Julian left the school immediately and went to visit Fouquet. Fouquet was surprised but worried. They'll make you do something bad, and the newspapers will learn. You can earn better money here, the liberal warned. The next day Julian arrived in Verrieres. He had lunch with Father Chilan, who was not happy to see him. Julien left and found a peasant. He borrowed a ladder from the peasant and went to Mr. de Renal's home. It was dark when he arrived. Julien put the ladder up to the window he knew, and he climbed up. There was no light in the window, so he knocked and whispered, It's a friend. I must be careful, he thought. If it's the wrong person, I might be shot. The window opened, and he saw a woman. It was Mrs. de Renal, and she was very angry. You horrible man! she yelled. What are you doing? I have been away for fourteen months, he said. I want to know everything that has happened. No! You get out! I don't care if you are discovered. Julien was hurt. Is it possible? Is it possible you don't love me any more? Julian wept. After some time, he said, Please tell me what has been happening to you. Everyone knew about us, she said. We were not careful at all. Father Chelan talked to me, and eventually he asked me about you. I told him the truth. I was so sad that all I did was sit in my room and write you letters. Father Chelan sent some to you. But you never replied. I never got your letters, I promise. She continued, My husband never loved me like I thought you loved me. Julien was filled with love, and he tried to hold her. She pushed him away. Tell me all about the school. Then you'll have to leave. Julien told her about his horrible life at the school. He slowly put his hand around her waist. She did not push him away, but she was still cold. Julien thought, If she throws me out, I'll be ashamed. I have one last chance. Julien told her about the offer in Paris. I am leaving soon, he said. I am leaving forever. Mrs. de Renal broke out into tears and fell into Julien's arms. For the last two hours, Julien had wanted her to act this way, but instead she was cold. Now, in the third hour, Julien won her over with skill, not with love. Julien felt great pleasure. Julien lit a light so he could see her, and they were together all night. In the morning, Julien was filled with his love, and he asked to stay in the room all day. She agreed. Why not? I have already ruined myself. Mrs. de Renal put the ladder outside the room and went to find a place to hide it. When she returned, the ladder was gone. Mrs. de Renal should have been alarmed, but she could only think of the next night when Julien would leave. Her life would have only regret. She knew she would have to kill herself. Julien was worried, but Mrs. de Renal showed no fear. She brought some food during the day, and that evening she dismissed Elisa and brought more food. Julien loved her more than ever. She was not used to hiding like this, but she had real courage. There was a knock at the door, and Julien jumped under the sofa. It was Mr. de Renal. Mr. de Renal said, Why was the door locked? You're still dressed, and you're eating. What's going on? She said she had a headache, and he left. Later he returned, banging on the door. There is a thief in the house. One of the servants found his ladder. Open this door immediately. Mrs. de Renal fell into Julian's arms. It's the end, she said. He'll kill us both. If I am going to die, I want to die with you. She kissed him with every bit of her love. 
You have young children, so you must live, he said. I'll jump into the garden and escape. You must throw my clothes to me. You'll be killed when you jump, was all she could reply. Julien jumped down, took his clothes, and ran towards the river. He heard a bullet whistle by his ear, and at the same time he heard a gunshot. Julien turned and ran another direction, and he heard more shots from the garden. Soon he reached the river and he put on his clothes. In an hour he was on his way to the city of Geneva in Switzerland. They won't think to look for me in another country, he thought. Book Two, Chapter One Pleasures of the Countryside. While Julien was waiting in the coach to Paris, he heard two men talking. Oh, it's my old friend Falcoz, said one man. My friend Saint Gerard, I thought you were living in a small town in Franche Comte, said Falcoz. Living? No, I'm running away, he replied. I love the fresh air and the trees. I hate politics, though, and politics is driving me out. Which party do you support? Falcoz asked his friend. None, and that's my problem. I was tired of the constant role playing in Paris, so I left for the country. The local priest and some rich landowners asked me to dinner. I told them I don't care about politics, and I don't read any newspapers. The priest was very angry. I wanted to give money to the poor, but he wanted me to give money to the congregation, the Jesuit group. I refused, and I had all kinds of problems. The priest said I was ungodly, and someone poisoned all the fish in my pond. The judge, who was a good man but afraid of the priest, always judged against me. To get some support, I decided to join the liberals. They would not leave me alone, though. I wouldn't vote for their horrible choice in the election, so they hated me too. It's over, he continued. I sold the house, and I'm going to lose a lot of money. I'm going to the only peaceful place, an apartment in Paris. None of this would have happened to you under Napoleon, Falcoz said angrily. All of my sufferings come from your Napoleon, St. Gerard replied. Napoleon was only great in battle. He brought back the church and he made them too powerful. He brought back the nobles and now everyone wants to be a noble. It was the church and the small town nobles that forced me to be a liberal. The conversation was long, and Julian asked about Mr. de Renal. St. Gerard laughed. So you know Verrieres? Your Mr. de Renal will soon be forced out by Mr. Valnau, he said. Napoleon gave people like Mr. de Renal and Father Chelan power, and after them people like Mr. Valnau and Father Maslon. Julien did not think much about Paris when he first saw it. He was still thinking about the last twenty four hours he spent with his lover. He promised he would never forget Mrs. de Renal's children. He would help them if the church caused so much trouble that there was another revolution. If there was another revolution, the nobles would be in trouble. Julien was not excited to see much of Paris. He only cared to see what his hero Napoleon left behind. He met Father Perard, and the priest told him about his new life in the house of Marquis de la Mole. You will wear a black suit, he said, but not like a priest. You will write his letters for him. You will not be paid much, but your salary can increase. The Marquis has a daughter and a son. The son is Count Norbert. Marquis de la Mole wants you to be friends, but I don't know why. You must be careful. Do not allow him to make fun of you. He will probably hate you because your family is poor. The Marquis's wife, Marquise de la Mole, is a very proud woman. She only cares about real nobility. Her family goes back to the Crusades when the Catholic Church tried to invade the Holy Land. Never talk bad about any king, even Henry the Eighth. They were kings. And she thinks that is more important than anything. 
she will see you as a religious servant. If this business does not work out, then come to see me. If we are still friends, you can be my assistant at my new church. If we are not, you should go to a different school. Julien thanked his good friend, and they took a coach to Marquis de la Mole's home. They arrived at the Marquis's home. There was a large sign that said, Hotel de la Mole. Julien said, These people are so afraid of Jacobins and another revolution, but they still tell everyone where their house is. Father Perard nervously said, I don't think you will last very long here. Chapter 2 Entry into Society Julien was astonished by the beauty of the house. Be careful, Father Perard said. If you act like a peasant, they will treat you like one. Julien became calm. I challenge them too, he said. They walked through the house and found a small, thin man. Father Perard introduced Julien to Marquis de la Mole. At first, Julien was not impressed by the Marquis, and he stared at him like a picture. Julien soon realized that this man was even more civil and nice than the Bishop of Besançon. The interview was over in three minutes. Father Perard and Julien left the home, and Father Perard gave his student a letter. This is from the Marquis, Father Perard said. He likes to do things himself, but soon you will do them for him. Go to this tailor and buy some new clothes. When Julien returned to Hotel de la Mole, the Marquis showed him his new room. The Marquis asked Julien how many shirts he bought. Two, Julien said. He was surprised this great man would think about such a little thing. Fine, fine, the Marquis said. Go buy twenty-two more. Here's the first part of your salary. How could I dislike it here, Julien thought. Mr. de Renal would be ashamed to help me like Marquis de la Mole just did. Julien was taken to the library where he would work. Julien was astonished by the number of books. I'll be able to read all of these, he thought. First, I'll do my work. Julien finished his writing quickly. The Marquis came in and looked sadly at his work. Possible, he said, is spelled with a double S. Please use the dictionary if you don't know how to spell a word. That evening Julien was introduced in the salon. There were many people there. Julien was happy to see the Bishop of Agda, who was so nice to him back in Verrieres. The bishop did not recognize the peasant. Mrs. de la Mole did not even look at him. Soon a handsome young man entered the room. He had a very small head. Julien realized this man was Count Norbert. Count Norbert seemed very nice. He also saw a young woman. Although she had beautiful eyes, they seemed very cold. Julien did not think she was attractive. He soon learned that this woman was Miss Matilda de la Mole. To Julien she looked cruel, just like her mother. Marquis de la Mole just looked bored. Norbert said Marquis de la Mole. I want you to be nice to this man, Mr. Julien Sorel. I've just hired him, and I want to make him into somebody, if at all possible. The Marquis told the crowd about Julien's education, and a man from the university asked him questions about Horace. This is how I won over the Bishop of Besançon, Julien thought. These people only know one writer. Julien spoke in perfect Latin, and the people were impressed. He had a long conversation with the professor. Julien was an expert on Horace, Tacitus, and other ancient writers, but he knew nothing of modern names like King George IV and the poets Lord Byron and Robert Southey. The professor said to the Marquisa, "'His manners are not good.' But perhaps he is a learned man. The Marquisa did not think about Julien, but she was happy she invited the professor. The Marquisa liked anyone that entertained her husband. 
Chapter Three, The First Steps. Early the next morning, Julienne was working in the library. Miss de la Mole came in through a secret door. She was surprised to see him, and she took a copy of a book by Voltaire. Voltaire was not considered good reading for a young noblewoman. In the afternoon, Count Norbert came in. He had forgotten about Julien. The Count suggested they go riding. "I can cut down trees," Julien said. "But I've only been riding six times. This will be the seventh." Count Norbert said, "Come on." Julien rode well most of the day, but at the end he fell into the mud. Later, Marquis de la Mole asked his son about the ride. Count Norbert was very polite, but Julien told the story honestly. The Marquis was surprised. "This man will go far," he said to the professor. "He'll tell the truth about this bad event." Later, Miss de la Mole asked him to tell the story again, and Julien, Miss Matilda, and Count Norbert laughed like young friends. Even with these friendly people, however, Julien still felt alone. He was too different. Chapter Four, The Hotel de la Mole. People thought Julien was very strange. And Marquisa de la Mole suggested they send him on business when important people came to dinner. The Marquis disagreed, saying, "I want to continue my experiment." Father Perard says we are wrong to destroy the pride of people we hire. He's only out of place because he acts differently. He's quiet anyway. In the salon, one could talk about anything as long as there were no jokes about God, the Church, the King, the government, or artists popular with the King's court, as long as no good thing was said about liberal newspapers, Voltaire or Rousseau, whose writings influenced the Revolution, and as long as no politics were discussed. The conversations were all very boring. Any new idea seemed rude. Every one wanted only to be polite. Politeness was more important than anything else. Some people only came to eat lots of ice cream. Later, Julien asked Father Perard, "Is it a requirement of my job to eat dinner with the Marquisa?" "It's an honor," Father Perard replied. "It's the worst part of my job, Father." I'm afraid of falling asleep. Please ask them to let me eat in a restaurant. Julien heard a noise, and he turned around. Miss de la Mole had been listening. She respected him more now. He's not a weak man who bows before my father. She thought. That night, Julien did not speak to Miss de la Mole, but she spoke to him. He sat with Miss de la Mole. Count Norbert and their friends, they had no mercy for the others. They made fun of almost everyone. Sometimes Julien laughed, but he did not truly understand. The conversation was like a foreign language. He knew the words, but not the meaning. Julien went to talk to Father Perard for a few minutes. The priest was not comfortable in this society. He was a strict Jansenist, and tried to be good. He did not like to think badly of every one he saw. When Julien returned, Miss de la Mole said, "That Father Pirard, what an ugly face he has!" Julien was angry, but she was right. The priest was the most honorable man in the room, but his face was awful. Whenever he had a true thought, it became worse. The others in the room had smooth faces, especially when they lied. Later that night, Count Norbert and his friends were making fun of a Mister de Thaler. Mister de Thaler was very rich, but few people liked him. When he left, Julien thought about the difference between Mister de Thaler and himself. 
This man makes more money in one hour than I make in a month. But they still make fun of him, Julian thought. It's enough to cure a man of envy. Chapter 5 Sensitivity After six months with the Marquis, Julien was trusted to handle most of his business. Marquis de la Mole signed almost every letter Julien wrote for him. The Marquis gave him a horse, and Julien practiced almost every day. Julien continued to study religion, and Father Perard introduced him to several Jansenist societies. Julien admired these men. They were not liars like other people in the church, and they never thought about money. At one society, he met Count Altamira, who had been sentenced to death. He was religious, and he loved freedom. This surprised Julien. Count Norbert stopped being friendly to Julien. He thought Julien was too sensitive. Julien spent his free time practicing shooting a gun learning to use a sword and riding horses. The salons of Paris were different from the small towns. Julien's pride was never hurt in the salon, but no one cared about him here. Chapter 6 What Decoration for a Man Julien returned one day from a business trip, and he saw Miss de la Mole again. By this time Julien knew how to act in Paris, and he was not friendly to Miss de la Mole. That night, at Salon, Matilda was very bored. She was smarter than all of her friends. Then she saw Julien. At least he was different. Mr. Sorel, are you coming to the dance tonight? She asked. I was not invited, he said. You can come with my brother, Matilda replied. Julienne said nothing. Come with my brother, she said quickly. Julienne was very angry. Am I just a servant now, he thought. Julienne was amazed by the dance. The room was very beautiful. Many of the guests were impressed by Matilda's beauty. She called Julienne over and asked him, you have been in Paris all winter. Is this the most beautiful dance you have seen? Julien quietly said, I spend my time writing. I have not seen a dance like this. Some other men were shocked, but Matilda was not. She said, You are like a philosopher. This dance amazes you, but does not impress you. Julien wanted to be cool to her, but he did notice how beautiful she was in her dress. The Marquis de Crossenois came over. He liked Matilda and wanted to marry her. Matilda did not want to talk to him because he was stupid and boring. She listened patiently, though, and then she saw Julien talking to Count Altamira. She knew about his conspiracy in his home country, and now he was sentenced to death. This was interesting to Miss de la Mole. The other men could buy anything, but a death sentence was one thing they could not buy. Maybe his conspiracy was stupid, she thought, but at least he did act. Marquis de Crossenois asked her to dance, and she accepted. Why don't I like him, she thought. The other women think he's perfect. He's handsome, rich, and powerful. He's so boring, though. Mr. Sorel is different, though, she thought. Chapter 7 The Dance Later, Matilda saw Julien talking to Altamira again. Julien usually looked so cold, but he had fire in his eyes. He has so much pride, she thought, he looks like a prince hiding in normal clothes. The two men walked past her, and she heard Julien say, Yes, Danton was a man. She was alarmed. Danton was one of the leaders of the French Revolution. She stopped Julien and said, Wasn't he a killer? Some people think so, he said angrily. But he started as a lawyer, 
like many people here in this room. Also, he was ugly. That is a serious crime to beautiful people. He walked away quickly. Matilda thought, how could a handsome man like Julien say good things about an ugly person? Count Altamira and Julien moved away, but Matilda followed. They continued to talk about politics. In these times, Count Altamira said, people do horrible things, but they don't enjoy them. Everything is boring. You and I are the only ones without guilt. But they hate me because I led a revolution, and they hate you because you were born poor. My revolution failed because I did not want to kill three people and take their money. I could have easily succeeded. If I had any power, Julian said, I'd kill three men to save four lives. He spoke strongly, and his eyes were bright. He looked to Matilda, and she was frightened. She moved away and went to dance. Count Altamira continued, Your society is old. Only appearances matter, not real thoughts. France has many great soldiers, but no one like George Washington of America. The next day in the library, Julien thought about Danton. What would happen to Danton today, he thought. I know, he'd work for the government. He wouldn't try to fight it. He did steal money, after all. The Spanish revolutionaries did not steal, though, and they were defeated easily. These thoughts made Julien very excited, and he did not notice Miss de la Mole at first. When he did, he looked at her. All the fire in his eyes died. You were thinking about something interesting, she said. Tell me what it is. I won't tell anyone, she said. The fire returned, and Julien said, Was Danton right to steal? Should the Spanish revolutionaries have stolen or killed to in? His face was terrible. If a man wants to change the world, must he be evil to many people? Matilda was shocked, and she could not look at him. She turned and ran out of the room. Chapter 8 Queen Marguerite The next day at dinner, Matilda was wearing all black clothes. Did a relative die? Julian wondered. When they were alone, he asked the professor. You don't know, the professor said. He was happy to be able to teach Julian. Matilda admired one of her ancestors, Boniface de la Mole. This man was the lover of Queen Marguerite de Navarre, and once he had tried to rescue some friends from the king's prison. His partner ran away, and Boniface de la Mole was put to death. The queen was so upset she sent her servant to get Boniface de la Mole's head. She secretly went late at night to Montmartre, the highest hill in Paris, and buried the head herself. Since Matilda was a child, she loved the story. Julienne was impressed. So many people were dishonest in Paris, but this woman was true. The two began to talk more often. Julien was impressed by her knowledge, and he began to talk openly. He forgot about his role as a revolutionary. One day Julien was thinking about the benefits of being a noble. Nobles don't have to worry about making money, but Julien had very little of his own. Matilda saw him and asked what he was thinking. His pride was strong, and he told her the truth. She thought he was very attractive at that moment. A month later she took his arm and walked in the garden. She said she hurt her foot, but Julien did not know if that was true. Does she like me? he thought. She never looks at other people like she looks at me. It would be funny if she loved me, he thought. He knew Marquis de la Mole wanted her to marry Marquis de Croissonnois. She is beautiful, though, Julien thought. 
When she looks at me with those big blue eyes, I can't think of anything else. Julian decided right then, I will have her, he thought, and no one will stop me. Chapter 9 The Power of a Young Lady If Julienne had watched Matilda in the salon instead of thinking about her beauty, he would understand her power in the salon. She was clever, and if someone made her unhappy, she could tell a joke that would hurt the person greatly. She didn't want the same things the others wanted, so they could not understand her. Some of the men had sent her letters, and she had replied. Once Marquis de Croissonnois returned to her a very personal letter. He thought he was being polite, but she thought him rude. There was no happiness for her without danger. She had everything. She was smart, she had money, and she was beautiful. What more could she want? She began to enjoy her conversations with Julien more and more. One day she realized the truth. I'm in love, she thought. Of course, for a woman my age I must be in love. This made Matilda happy, because she knew how boring her life would be with Marquis de Croissonnois. This man was half liberal, half conservative, and never great. He could never do something extreme, but every great action was extreme when begun. Chapter 10 Might he be a Danton? Julien and I have no agreement to be married, and there are no lawyers, Matilda thought. Everything is heroic, just like Queen Marguerite and Boniface de la Mole. She was thinking about this, and she said nice things about Julien to her brother and father. Count Norbert was surprised and said, Watch out for that young man who has so much energy. If the revolution starts up again, he'll have us all guillotined. Her brother's words worried Matilda. He'd be a Danton, she thought. My brother and Marquis de Croissonnois would die quietly, but Julien would shoot anyone who tried to take him to the guillotine. He's not afraid of looking bad. Count Norbert, Marquis de Croissonnois, and Mr. de Luz, her brother's friend, all made jokes about Julien. Matilda noticed that whenever they said something clever, they all looked to Julien first. One day they talked to her about Julien. Matilda said, If one day he discovered he had a noble as his real father, in six months he would be an army officer, just like you. Matilda was bored except when she was talking with Julien. She congratulated herself on choosing to be in love with him. It was good that it was dangerous. Julien did not know any of this, but he did see Matilda look at him with her beautiful eyes. Is this love? he thought again. It's so different from the way Mrs. de Renal looked at me. Chapter 11 A Plot The next day Julien caught Count Norbert and his sister talking about him. When they saw him, they stopped talking. Are these people planning on making fun of me? Julien thought. That's more likely than Miss de la Mole loving a poor secretary. She was from the high class, after all. Julien soon discovered that she was secretly reading all of Voltaire's books. He began to think she was completely two-faced. Julien admired this, just like he admired Father Maslon, Vicar General de Ferler, and Father Castaneda. They were evil, but powerful. Julien imagined many things, and he showed no friendship to Matilda. Matilda did not stop, though, and Julien decided he needed to stay away for a while. Marquis de la Mole had trusted him with some business in Languedoc, far away from Paris. He told the Marquis he needed to take a trip there, and the Marquis agreed. 
He did not tell Matilda, but she soon knew about it. The day before he left, Julian was alone with Matilda in the garden. She said, You'll get a letter from me tonight. It's important you don't leave tomorrow. Find an excuse. Her body looked wonderful as she ran off. One hour later, a servant gave Julian a letter. It declared her love. Julian was extremely happy. He had beaten Marquis de Crossenois, a man who was so rich and handsome. Julian went to Marquis de la Mole and told him that he needed to stay to look after the lawsuit. The Marquis agreed easily and said, I'm glad you're not leaving. I like having you around. This made Julian uncomfortable. I'm about to seduce his daughter, he thought. Oh, but why should I pity this family? I am poor and they have everything. The letter he had made him proud, and it made him stand like a hero. Still, he was careful. He made a copy of the letter, hid it in a Bible, and sent it to Fouquet. Then he wrote out his reply. Can this really be Miss de la Mole who gave a letter to a poor man from the countryside? I'm sure you only wanted to make fun of me. The letter was as good as something written by Mr. de Bouvasis. It was only ten o'clock, and Julian felt great. So he went to the Italian opera. He heard his friend Geronimo sing, and it lifted him high. He was a god. Chapter 12 A Young Lady's Thoughts For the first time in Matilda's life, her feelings were stronger than her pride. Fear of doing wrong was important to people like de Crossenois and de Luz, but not to her. Her real fear was that Julien did not like her. Those other men had no character. What would Boniface de la Mole say if he saw the revolution in 1789 and saw seventeen of his descendants die at the guillotine without fighting? Matilda, though, had written to a poor man herself. This fact would dishonor her if it was discovered. She did not know Julian's character, and this frightened her greatly. If I make him my lover, what else would he want, she thought. The next morning Julian went to the library. As soon as he sat down, Matilda entered the room. He gave her his letter, and she dashed off. Is she playing a game with Count Norbert, he thought? I cannot let myself feel anything for this doll. I should not have stayed in Paris. Julien thought about this mistake until Matilda returned. She gave him another letter and fled. Julien thought, it's to be love by letter. My enemy has made a mistake. The two men met in the hall, and Matilda took Julian's next letter with laughter in her eyes. Poor Mrs. de Renal's eyes always had love, he thought, never laughter like this. At five o'clock she gave Julian the next letter. Julian turned pale when he read the short letter. I must talk to you tonight. At midnight, take the ladder in the garden and come to my room. Chapter 13. Is it a plot? This is getting serious, thought Julien, and a little too obvious. Matilda can talk to me in the library with total freedom, but going to her room puts me at complete risk. It's clear they want to hurt me, or at least make fun of me. He packed his bags to leave. When he finished, he thought, what if Matilda was in good faith? If I left, she'd think I am afraid. I'll lose the most beautiful woman of high society, and I won't defeat Marquis de Crossenois. I might be shot, but this is my only chance. Her letters. They'll think I have them with me. Marquis de Crossenois and Mr. de Luz themselves will be there. I'll hide copies in the library. What if they try to kill me? No. I'll be ready, he thought, and he prepared his small guns. 
The bell rang for dinner, and Julien became very afraid. He studied the other people. Which ones will be there tonight? He looked for answers in Miss de la Mole's face, but he saw nothing. She looked like a queen. She was truly beautiful and impressive. It almost made him fall in love. He went to the garden and examined the ladder. This day it is mine to use, just like in Verrieres, he thought. How different this is. In Verrieres, I never had to fear the person for whom I took risks. Now there's so much more danger. That evening was extremely painful. Chapter 14 One O'Clock in the Morning At midnight, Julien was in the garden. He searched the garden like a spy. If de Crossenois is waiting, he thought, he'll want to catch me before I get to her room. The weather was very clear, and the moon was bright. She's mad, he thought. It's one o'clock, and her light is still on. He waited five more minutes, and he put the ladder up to her window. He climbed up with one hand on his gun. When he reached the window, it opened, and Matilda said, So you've come, sir. I've watched you for the last hour. Julian didn't know what to say, so he tried to kiss her. How dare you! She said, pushing him away. Julian wanted to leave, so he turned around. What is in your pocket? Matilda asked. She was happy to have something to say. I have all kinds of guns and knives. You must lower the ladder. She replied, Use this rope. I always have rope in my room. So this is a woman in love, thought Julien. She shows so much wisdom. I can't be the first man. I must be following de Crossenois. What do I care? This will still be a victory. What have you done with my letters? She asked. I've copied them and sent them away, he replied. Why were you so careful? Julien told her about all of his fears. So that's why your letters were so cold. Matilda sounded angry rather than loving, but Julien did not notice. Matilda tried to say kind words, but she had trouble. They talked of how they could see each other again. He's already thinking about next time, Matilda thought. He thinks he's my master. I have made a mistake, but I must continue. I told myself if he was brave enough to use the ladder, I would give myself to him. She gave herself to him that night, but her pleasure was not real. It was a duty to finish. Through it all, she controlled what she said. When it was over, Julian felt strange, but not happy. How different it was from his last twenty-four hours in Verrieres. The Parisian manners could ruin anything. The next morning he took his horse to a forest far from Paris. He was more amazed than happy. He felt like a soldier who had suddenly been made a general. Could I have made a mistake? thought Matilda. Maybe I'm not in love with him after all. Chapter 15 An Old Sword Matilda did not come to dinner that night, and in the evening she did not look at Julien. She'll tell me why, he thought. She has an unfriendly face. She's not the same woman as last night. The next day and the next day after, she was the same, Maybe she hates me, he thought. It would be reasonable for her to regret our love, since I'm just a peasant. These thoughts were so different from his love with Mrs. de Renal. I have a master, Matilda said to herself. She hated the sound of the word. He has control over me, and if he wanted to hurt me, he could hurt me badly. Julien followed her to the garden. She stopped him and said, you have a strong hold on me. You will speak to me, even though I don't want to speak to you. I will keep our love secret, Julien said. 
I'll even add that I will never say another word to you if you want. He bowed respectfully and left. That night Julian realized that he did love her, and he was almost in tears. In two days he decided to leave for Languedoc. He went to the library to find Marquis de la Mole, but instead he found Matilda. She was cruel to him, but he could not be strong. So, you don't love me any more, he said. I can't believe I gave myself to the first man who came along, she said, weeping with shame. His suffering increased when he saw her tears of shame, and he ran to an old sword the Marquis had hung on the wall. He drew the sword and turned to Matilda. She was so surprised by this that her tears stopped and she moved proudly towards Julian. Me? Kill the Marquis's daughter? Julian thought. He looked at the old sword and then he calmly placed it back on the wall. Julian turned to look at her. All the hate had left her face. I was about to be killed by my lover, Matilda was amazed. This was like a story of old France. I might become weak, she thought, and she fled. Goodness, she's beautiful, Julian thought. This is the same girl who threw herself into my arms less than a week ago. Those times will never return. Who can I talk to, he thought. Father Perard won't help me, and Count Altamira would tell me to enter a conspiracy. Who can guide me? What will become of me? Chapter 16 Cruel Moments Miss de la Mole thought of nothing except almost being killed. He's worthy of being my master, since he almost killed me. How many fine young men from high society could have a thought like that? He looked handsome when he returned the sword. I wasn't crazy to love him after all. At dinner she talked to Julienne, and she ordered him to follow her to the garden. She looked curiously at the hands that almost killed her, and she began to tell him about the feelings she used to have for Marquis de Croissonnois. Julien had never felt worse. His heart ached with jealousy. Julien had thought himself better than de Croissonnois, but now he suffered. He admired Matilda so much that he almost fell to her feet and asked for mercy. This pain went on for almost a week. Matilda enjoyed causing Julien pain. Julien could have changed her feelings, but he did not understand them. Instead, he finally said, You don't love me any more, but I love you. This was the biggest mistake he could have made. In one moment he destroyed all the good feelings in Matilda's heart. Matilda, sure of being loved, hated him completely. Julien did not understand anything from the last week, but he understood this hate. He avoided her and told the Marquis he was sick. Matilda was again bored with the de Croissonnois and de Luz. These men were always scared of a revolution. But if she was with Julien, she would not be afraid. He had ambition and character, but no money or friends. She could give these to him, but her mind still treated Julien like a lesser person, one who could be made to love at any time. Chapter 17 The Italian Opera Matilda sometimes regretted her happiness with Julien. I made a mistake, she thought. But at least I made a mistake with a man of character. It wasn't his good looks, but his mind. It was foolish of me, she thought, to be angry because he expressed his love. Am I not his wife? This thought came naturally. As she thought, she drew in her diary. When she looked down, she saw that she had drawn a picture of Julienne. It's a sign from heaven, she thought. She stayed in her room until her mother made her leave for the opera. At the opera, she could not speak. The music filled her heart. 
thanks to her love of music, she felt the way Mrs. de Renal did when she thought of Julien. She believed she had defeated love. Julien did not understand any of this. He had a strong sense of honor, though, and he could not ask anyone for advice. From his window he saw Matilda walking in the garden. When she left, he went down and walked in her steps. He looked up at her window, and he saw her light go out. In one instant he decided, I will go to her room. He went to the ladder. It was chained up. In a moment of extreme strength he broke the chain. He flew up the ladder and knocked. The window opened and he fell inside, more dead than alive. So it's you, my love, she said, throwing herself into his arms. No words can describe Julian's happiness. Matilda's was almost as great. Punish me, she said. You are my master. I am your slave. Julian had to stop her from cutting a bunch of hair off her head. I want to remember that I'm your servant. They had made too much noise, and Mrs. de la Mole woke up next door. Julien held her one last time, and then he jumped out the window. He did not climb down the ladder. He slid. When he got down, he realized that he was bloody and he had no clothes. Something fell into his hands. It was some of Matilda's hair. This is what your servant sends you, she said loudly. You will always be my master. He almost went back to the room, but his reason won. The next day Julien saw the damage. Everyone could see that the side of her head had almost no hair. She was never alone that day. Later she said, My mother has ordered my maid to stay in my room tonight. Julien was on top of the world. The next day at lunch Matilda was cool, however. Her whole behavior had changed. She seemed to regret her actions. What have I done? he thought. I must kill my heart. Julian took his horse out and rode until he could not move. Julian is dead, he thought. Only his body still moves. Chapter 18 The Secret Letter Marquis de la Mole called him. The Marquis looked young. Let's talk about your memory. I hear it's good. Could you learn four pages and recite them perfectly in London? Yes, Julien answered. Without changing a single word? Yes, if you want. Tomorrow I could tell you everything that's in today's paper. I will take you to a salon. Twelve people will speak. You will make notes of what each person says, said the Marquis. You will then write four pages from these notes, and then you'll leave Paris. You'll pretend to be a person traveling for fun. You'll meet a duke, and you will need to fool all of his staff. The duke himself will copy those four pages. You won't be bored, because some people will want to kill you. Go buy some clothes. I want you to look foolish tonight. Julien came back wearing silly-looking clothes. The Marquis laughed. He knew he could trust Julien. If I can't trust Julien, he thought, who can I trust? My son is brave, but he could never do this job. At the salon, Julien stayed at one side. He watched people enter the salon. The host was a very large man. Another man was short and broad. His face looked cruel, like a wild pig. A thin man came in. He was wearing many vests. Julien recognized the Bishop of Agda. Soon a small, dark man came in, talking quickly. Julien was not comfortable. He was hearing some very strange things. This is some kind of conspiracy, he thought. Chapter 19 
the discussion. A servant entered and said, "The Duke of." Be quiet, you fool," the Duke said. Marquis de la Mole said, "Everyone, this is Father Julian Sorel. He has an astonishing memory. In one hour, he learned the first page of the newspaper." The host asked Julian to show his skill. After twenty lines, the host stopped him. Everyone was satisfied. "It's this gentleman's turn to speak," the host said. Pointing to the man with many vests, Julian thought he looked like a bishop. No names were used. The man with the vest spoke for a long time. Finally, he said, "England gave lots of money to defeat the Jacobins. They don't have any money left for our cause. Without England's money, Austria, Russia, and Prussia cannot fight for a long time." The Marquis stood and said. England's nobles hate Jacobinism as much as we do. Without English gold, Austria, Russia, and Prussia can only fight two or three battles. Will that be enough to take France? I don't think so. We must have our own strong armies. Every province must have five hundred faithful men, including our own sons. If we cannot provide an army. The foreign kings will not help us. If the Jacobins win, there will be no more kings, no more gentlemen, and no more priests. There will only be democracy and people. We must act now to stop this. There is a duke who can help us. Chapter Twenty: The Church, Forests, and Freedom. A religious man stood up. He said, "It's impossible to start the army we want without the church. We must give everything to the church and the priests. They are the only people that can speak to the common people. If every priest talks to the people, they will give us our army." The discussion was very active. Many people were angry, and they all talked openly. These people will poison me, Julian thought. How can they say these things in front of a peasant? The host stopped them. We must decide, he said, what letter Mister Sorel will take to our friend across the border. At three in the morning, Julien and the Marquis left. The Marquis wrote out the letter. In the morning, they went to a house far from Paris. The Marquis was not worried about Julien's memory, but he feared Julien would be caught. Julian left for the next town. As soon as he was on the road, he forgot about his mission. His mind was only on Matilda. At a village, the post officer told him there was no carriage for the next town. Julian was angry, but he ordered some food. He did not trust the officer. He had a happy surprise, though. Sitting next to the fire with several Germans was his friend Geronimo, the opera singer. "Let's go outside," Geronimo said. When they were far away, he said, "Do you know what's going on? I gave a child some money, and he told me there are many horses down the street. They want to delay some messenger." "Really," Julian said innocently. "Let's wait until tomorrow. We'll order breakfast while they make it." We'll sneak out and hire some horses. Julian did not know if he could trust Geronimo, but there was nothing to do. He went to bed, but he woke up when he heard two people in his room. Julian touched his gun, which was under the pillow. The post officer was there with a man in priest's clothes. He won't wake up, the post officer said. We gave him some of the wine you prepared. There are no letters here," the priest said. "The other one is probably the messenger. I think his Italian accent is fake." The priest turned around. It was Father Castagneda from the school. Julian badly wanted to kill the evil man, but it would ruin his mission. He waited fifteen minutes and then he yelled, "Help! I've been poisoned. I'm in so much pain." And then went to check on Geronimo. Geronimo was almost dead from the poison, and Julian couldn't wake him up. 
he had to leave alone. Julien reached the Duke's home without more trouble. When he found the Duke, they went to a low class coffee house. In a small room, Julien told the Duke everything, and the Duke wrote it all down. Wait one half hour, and then go to Strasbourg, the Duke commanded. Wait there for two weeks, and then return. Silence! Julien admired the man. That's the way to do business. It took two days to get to Strasbourg. Father Castaneda works for the congregation, Julien thought. If he had recognized me, I'd be dead. Chapter 21 Strasbourg Trapped in Strasbourg for a week, Julien thought only of Matilda. She was in control of his happiness. Ambition could make him forget his love of Mrs. de Renal, but nothing could make him forget Matilda. He was unhappy until he heard someone yell to him. Julien looked up and saw his friend from London, Prince Korosov. You're not acting like I thought you, Korosov said. Looking unhappy is bad. To be aristocratic, you must look bored. What's wrong? Have you lost your money, or are you in love with some actress? This joke almost made Julian cry. To be honest, I am in love. She doesn't love me any more, Julian told his story, but he made new names for everyone. I am your doctor, the prince said. Here's what to do. One, see her every day, but don't be cold. Two, pay attention to another woman. What other woman will you choose? I know a woman, Julian said, who is very rich and does not love anyone. He was thinking of Mrs. de Fervax, whose husband was dead. That's perfect, Korosov said. Write two letters to her every day. You don't even have to invent them. I have six boxes of letters ready for you to copy. Julien was much happier when he went to bed that night. Julien and his friend went riding every day. Prince Korosov really liked Julien, and finally he said, I have a cousin in Moscow. You should marry her. With my uncle's influence and the Legion of Honor cross you have, you'll go far in the army. I can't do that, Julien thought. Leaving Matilda would be too painful. I won't take my friend's cousin, but I'll take his advice. I'll seduce Mrs. de Fravox. She may be boring, but her eyes are like the woman I love. Chapter 22 The Department of Virtue As soon as he returned to Paris, Julien went to see Count Altamira. Julien told his friend he was deeply in love with Mrs. de Fravox. Let's go see Bustos, Altamira said. He tried to date Mrs. de Fravox. Mr. Diego Bustos wanted to know everything. He listened quietly, and then he spoke for a long time. This Englishwoman sometimes hates people strongly. Has she had a lover before? Can you succeed? She wrote me these letters. Take them so you will know the way she writes. As Julian was leaving, Bustos said, Count Altamira says you're one of us. One day you'll help us win our battles. When Julien returned home, it was almost time for dinner. He was going to see Matilda again. He dressed very carefully. Fool, he thought, I must follow Prince Korosov's advice. Julien changed into very plain traveling clothes. Julien did not talk to Matilda, but he did not hide from her. Marquis de la Mole praised him to everyone, and Julien was very nice to Mrs. de la Mole. At eight o'clock, Mrs. de Favox arrived. Julien went to his room and changed into very nice clothes. This made Mrs. de la Mole happy, and she introduced Julien to Mrs. de Favox. He followed Korosov's plan. Julien pretended to admire her, and he treated it like a battle to be won. Matilda thought Julien would talk to her when he returned. 
She thought he would try to win her again, and she was surprised to see him only talking to Mrs. de Fervax. He appeared to be cured. Prince Korasov would have been very proud of Julian. Julian did not realize that Mrs. de Fervax and Marquis de la Mole had enough power to make him a bishop. Chapter 23 Properly in Love This family is very strange, Mrs. de Fervax thought. They all love this young priest. He does have nice eyes, though. Julienne had trouble speaking to Mrs. de Fervax. Matilda, upset that Julienne was hiding from her, sat near Mrs. de Fervax one day. Julienne could see her eyes, and this made him upset at first. Soon he began speaking very well. He talked to Mrs. de Fervax, but he only wanted to impress Matilda. He succeeded. Matilda was very upset that night. When Julien returned to his room, he saw Prince Korasov's letters. I'm late, he thought. I should have copied the first letter long ago. The next morning he read the other instructions. Deliver the letter in person. Wear nice clothes and look very sad. If you see a maid, wipe your eyes and talk to her. He did this exactly. The next day Julian again looked at Matilda and spoke well to Mrs. de Fervax. This young priest is special, Mrs. de Fervax thought. I can see it in the letter he wrote to me. Chapter 24 Manon Lescote Prince Korasov's instructions said never to oppose what the woman says. One night at the opera, Julien praised the ballet based on the novel Manon Lescote. Mrs. de Fervax said that the novel was better. This surprised Julien. A woman like Mrs. Fervax would not read a novel. All novels are bad, of course. But I've heard this one is better than most. She said, It did not stop your Napoleon from saying it's a novel for servants, though. Julien became nervous. Someone's trying to ruin me, he thought. Someone told her that I admire Napoleon. When they left the opera, Mrs. de Fervax said, Remember, sir, that you cannot have devotion to Napoleon and devotion to me. Devotion to me, Julien thought. Either this means nothing or it means everything. Julien wrote the Marquis's letters and learned that Matilda might marry Marquis de Crossenois. Julien was so sad that he once thought of killing himself. The next day he saw Matilda's beautiful eyes, though, and he decided to follow Prince Korasov's plan until the end. Chapter 25 Boredom Mrs. de Fervax first read Julien's letters with no interest. She began to think about them, but she wished Julien was a proper priest. It would be so easy, she thought, to make him a vicar general near Paris. Then it would not hurt my rank in high society. One day she received no letters from Julien, so she decided to write him. Days later a servant brought another letter into the library, but Matilda walked in and grabbed the letter. This is something that I will not put up with, she said. You've forgotten all about me, and I'm your bride. She burst into tears. Julien was astonished. He had two thoughts. The first was of complete happiness. The second was one for Korasov. I may lose everything with a single word. I can't touch her or she'll hate me. Matilda was shocked by what she said. She opened Julien's desk and saw all of Mrs. de Fervax's letters. None had been opened. So, she shouted, You know her well, but you hate her. Forgive me, she cried, and she fell to his feet. Dislike me if you want, but please love me. I can't live without your love. Chapter 26 A Box at the Italian Opera Julien was more astonished than happy. 
he realized how wise the Russian plan was. Matilda looked at the letters. Tell me this, she said. I have too much pride, I know. Mrs. de Fervaque has stolen you from me. Has she given you what I have given you? Julian did not answer. Her eyes were filled with sadness. Julian almost gave up at that point. He wanted to hold her. He wanted to kiss her everywhere. I have my pride too, he quietly said. I may love that woman, but I don't know how she feels. But she was nice to me when another woman hated me. Oh, good God! Matilda cried. What promise can you make me? he replied. Your heart will change in a few days. She cried and her dress moved a little. He could see her beautiful shoulders. He almost gave in at that moment, but he knew he would regret it. He stood up and walked away, saying, Miss de la Mole will allow me to think about this. That monster, she thought, he's not moved at all. No, I'm the monster. He is good and wise. That night, Julian did not go to dinner. He had to go to the opera, though. Mrs. de Fervax had invited him. The music brought him to tears, and Mrs. de Fervax saw them. She wanted to talk to him, so she said, Have you seen the de la Mole ladies? They're downstairs. Julian jumped up and looked down. It wasn't their night for the opera, but Matilda was there. Her eyes were filled with tears. Chapter 27 Frightening Her Julian ran down to Matilda. The only word she said to him was, Promises. I must not speak to her, he thought. I can still lose everything. When he returned home, he calmed down. He compared himself to a general who has half won a battle. I have an advantage, he thought, but what will I do tomorrow? As he thought about this, he read from a book by Napoleon. This heart is very different from Mrs. de Renal's, he thought. Frighten her, he thought suddenly. The enemy will obey me as long as she is afraid. She must doubt my love for her. He knew she would go to the library at eight o'clock, so he didn't arrive until nine. He burned with love, but his mind was in control. Dishonor me, she said plainly. We'll go to London. I'll be dishonored. That will be my promise to you. Julian was surprised. He replied, And after you're dishonored, will you still love me in a week? I'm not a monster. I don't want to see you dishonored. If she would love me for a week, he thought, I'd die of happiness. I'm not worthy of you, she said. Julian kissed her. Immediately he pulled away. That day and the following days he hid his love, but he became surer of her love. Chapter 28 The Tiger For the first time ever, Matilda felt what it is to love. She discovered she was pregnant. Will you still have doubts? She said. Isn't this a promise? I'm your wife forever. This astonished Julien. He almost forgot his plan. How can I be so cold to this woman who is ruining herself for me, he thought. I want to write to my father, Matilda said. He's also my friend, and I don't want us to lie to him. My God, what are you going to do, he cried. My duty, Matilda replied, her eyes filled with joy. But he'll throw me out. He has that right. If he throws you out, I'll go with you. The astonished Julien begged her to wait a week. She refused. So he said, All right then, I order you to wait. Your honor is safe with me. Just imagine your father's sorrow. Do you mean, she said, Imagine his desire for revenge. I am upset about hurting your father, but I do not and will not fear anyone. 
The next week, Marquis de la Mole read the letter. Dear Papa, all social ties are finished. Now we only have ties of family. I have a husband now. If you can give us some money, I will move far away. No one will know my husband's name, Mr. Sorel. I was the first to love. I seduced him. There is no finer man, and I will go with him. A servant came to get Julienne. The Marquis wants to see you now. Chapter 29 The Pain of Weakness Marquis de la Mole had never been angrier. He screamed at Julien. I'm not perfect, Julien said. You have been very good to me. The only people that understood me were you and this delightful person. Delightful, the Marquis shouted. When you found her delightful, you should have left. I tried. I asked you to let me go to Languedoc, Julien answered. You should have fled. It was your duty. Julien quickly wrote a short letter. My life is unbearable. I want to kill myself. I'm sorry for bringing trouble to the Marquis. Take this letter and kill me, or have your servant do it, Julien said. Go to hell, screamed the Marquis. Who can I talk to? Julien thought. Count Altamira? Can he stay silent forever? Father Perard won't help me. He is too much of a Jansenist. Wait, I'll confess to him. Then he'll advise me. Father Perard was not complete surprised. I expected this love. The Marquis will probably try to send you to America. Matilda was very worried. Her father had shown her Julian's suicide note. If he dies, I will die too. Maybe you'll be happy. But first, I'll be his widow in public. I won't be afraid. When Julian returned, Matilda met him outside. You must flee, she said. Stay with Father Perard. I'll handle everything here. You must trust me. Father Perard told the Marquis that Matilda and Julien must be married. Anything else would be a crime before God, he said. Marquis de la Mole saw this wisdom, but it made him angry. He was ambitious. He wanted his daughter to have a noble husband. I never thought this could happen, he thought. This century is crazy. Chapter 30 a man of intelligence. The Marquis could not reach a decision for more than a month. Finally, he gave a short letter to Matilda. The letter gave Julien and Matilda some houses near Languedoc. They were worth a lot of money. This surprised Julien and made him very happy. Matilda wanted to have a public wedding, though. One day she was angry and wrote to her father, I have waited six weeks out of respect for you, but soon I will go to Father Perard to be married. I'm afraid people will use this against you, though. If you come, everything will be fine. So it's time to make a decision, Marquis de la Mole thought. He sometimes imagined that Julien was killed. Other days he imagined Julien as a noble. The Marquis could give him a new name and invent a story about an illegitimate birth. He's very clever, the Marquis thought, but there's something I don't trust about him. The Marquis wrote a letter to his daughter. I am making him an officer in the army. His new name is Mr. Julien Sorel de la Vernay. He must leave tomorrow for Strasbourg. Matilda was happy and wrote back. Mr. de la Vernay will be very happy, but please don't forget about me. I won't send your letter until you promise we will have a public marriage. The reply came quickly. Fear me, girl. I don't know what kind of person this Julian is, and neither do you. Obey me, or I'll do nothing. That night Julian was full of joy. To be an officer in the army had always been his ambition. Chapter 31 
a storm. Father Pirard told Julien the news. The Marquis gave you some money. He has also settled his lawsuit with Vicar General de Ferler, the Jesuit. He's too powerful for us to fight. Part of the agreement is that the priest must recognize your noble birth. Julien thanked his good friend and left for Strasbourg. He was filled with ambition. He was surprised by a servant from Hotel de la Mole with a letter from Matilda. Come quickly. All is lost, I fear. I love you. He was in Paris very soon. Matilda fell into his arms. My father has gone, but here's his letter. I can forgive many things, but Julian seduced you because you're rich. I will never allow you to marry this man. I asked people about him, and eventually I talked to Mrs. de Renal. Where is the letter from Mrs. de Renal? he asked coldly. Here it is. Letter. Religion forces me to tell you this. This man was poor and ambitious, and he seduced an unhappy woman to gain some power. I think he has no religious faith. He leaves nothing behind but pain and regret. I cannot blame Marquis de la Mole, Julien said. What father would give his daughter to a man like that? He left for Verrieres immediately. He arrived on Sunday morning. Julien walked into the new church and saw Mrs. de Renal in prayer. He saw the woman who had loved him. His arm shook as he raised his gun. He fired a shot at her and missed. He fired a second shot. She fell. Chapter 32 Sorry Problems Everyone in the church ran out quickly. Julien felt a hand on his neck. It was a police officer. They took him to the prison. It's all over, Julien said. In two weeks I'll go to the guillotine. Mrs. de Renal was not going to die. She was only hit in the shoulder. But she wanted to die. She wanted Julien to kill her. She gave some money to Elisa, her maid. Take this to the prison guard. I want him to treat Julien well. A judge came to the prison. Julien said, I killed her, and I plan to kill her. The law says I must die, and I am ready for it. There is only one thing left, Julien thought. I must write to Matilda. I have taken my revenge. I am sorry everyone will talk about me. You should never talk about me, even to my son. One year after I die, you must marry Marquis de Crossenois. Don't write to me. I won't answer. After writing the letter, Julien became deeply unhappy. While he was thinking, the guard came to talk to him. You know, the guard said, she isn't dead. Mrs. de Renal is getting better. For the first time, Julien believed in God. He was truly sorry for what he had done. This woman had taken away all of his happiness, but he didn't hate her. She will live, he thought. She will live to forgive and love me. Chapter 33 A Prison The police moved Julien to another prison in Besançon. Father Chelan came to visit Julien. Oh God, is this possible, my child? Monster, I should say. The kind old man could not talk any more. Julien saw his old teacher openly weep. For the first time, Julien thought about killing himself. He wanted to be brave, though. He wanted to die without fear. Fouquet also came to visit him. Julien's friend was full of sorrow, and he kept talking about an escape. Fouquet's plan was to sell all his land to help Julien. This man would sacrifice everything, Julien thought. What man from Paris would do this? Fouquet sold wood to many people. One person was Vicar General de Ferler. Fouquet bowed before the priest and begged him to help Julien. Mr. de Ferler was surprised by Julien's actions. Maybe I can benefit from this, the priest thought. Perhaps I can use him to make friends with Marquis de la Mole, 
who likes this little student. Chapter 34 A Powerful Man The next morning Julien woke up very early and saw a peasant woman. When she threw herself into his arms, Julien realized it was Matilda. You beast! she said. Until I got to Verrières, I didn't know about your crime. It was noble revenge, and it shows you have a good heart. I had planned your future, Julien said. After I died, you would marry Marquis de Crossenois. He would accept a widow. If people hear that you came to Besançon, it will hurt Marquis de la Mole. I came using my maid's passport. People won't know it's me. She studied Julien. In her eyes, he was Boniface de la Mole, but even more heroic. Matilda did not want people to notice her, but the whole town did. After a week of waiting, she managed to meet Vicar General de Frelar. She was very afraid, but when she met the Vicar General, she became calm. This man was not so evil. He might be someone from Paris. Matilda admitted her real name. I want you to help me free Mr. de la Vernay. The vicar general was surprised. Matilda showed him Julien's army papers. My father gave him this name after we married in secret. The priest's face changed slowly from a friendly one to an ambitious one. He knew Matilda was friends with Mrs. de Fervac. Perhaps he could become a bishop. If thirty-six people were chosen for a jury, I would have at least ten friends. I'm sure I could have him found not guilty. Then the priest told her what everyone in Besançon knew. Julien and Mrs. de Renal were lovers. It could be that jealousy caused this crime, he said. She has been seeing a priest from Dijon, a Jansenist. He is without morals, like all of them. Why else would he choose to shoot her in the church? These words hurt Matilda. I have control of this beautiful woman now, the priest thought. Chapter 35 Peace Later two lawyers came. They were Julian's defense. It was murder, Julian said. I am very sorry about it, but you have little work to do. I must be braver than these men, Julian thought. They fear death, but I will not think about it until the day it comes. One lawyer believed, like most of Besançon, that jealousy was Julian's reason. He said this could be a good defense. If you value your life, Julian said angrily, you will never say that lie again. The names of the jury members were soon chosen. Vicar General de Ferlaire was happy to see that the list had five members of the congregation and three of his friends from Verrières. Mr. Valneau, Mr. de Maraud, and Mr. de Cholin. I can control these eight people, the priest said. The newspaper printed the names, and Mrs. de Renal left Verrières for Besançon. Mr. de Renal allowed her as long as she never left her room. I am now a liberal, and if you do anything it will cause me trouble, he said. When she arrived in Besançon, she wrote a letter to every person on the jury asking that they let Julien go free. Chapter 36 The Trial At last the day of the trial came. Fouquet was shocked. The whole province had come to Besançon to see the romantic trial. We will win this trial, Vicar General de Frelair said to Matilda. I can count on half of the jury to vote how I wish. Mr. Valenot owes everything to me, and I told the others to vote with him. What kind of man is Mr. Valenot? Matilda asked. He was born to be a leader of fools. He will fight the others until they agree. Julien did not want to speak at the trial. These people from the provinces want to see me killed. 
My sacrifices have inspired them, Matilda said. One word from you, and the public will support you. When he entered the courtroom, Julian saw many women in the audience. One was Mrs. Derville. Oh, no, he thought, she'll tell Mrs. de Renal. The prosecutor talked for a long time. Julian looked to the jury and saw Mr. Valnau staring at him. He'll be happy to see me killed, Julian thought. Julian had decided not to speak, but at the end he changed his mind. I am not asking you for mercy, he said. I tried to murder a great woman. I deserve to die for that. But that is not my only crime. To you, I am a rebellious peasant. You want to punish me because I tried to make myself better. I was educated and I joined society. For that I will be punished. Because none of you are like me. You are all rich men and you were never poor. Julian talked like this for twenty minutes. All the women were weeping, even Mrs. Derville. It was not until two o'clock in the morning that the jury made their decision. Mr. Valenot walked in slowly and read the decision. Julien was guilty. The sentence was death. What a victory for Mr. Valenot, thought Julien. He has won, and now I'll never see Mrs. de Renal again. Chapter 37 Reluctant to be a part. Julien was woken up by the feeling of tears on his hand. It's Matilda again, he thought. He opened his eyes to see Mrs. de Renal weeping. Is it true? Am I seeing you before I die? he said. Oh, but I'm just a murderer to you. Mrs. de Renal said, Please sign the appeal. Forgive me. If you want me to forgive you, please sign the appeal. He kissed her all over. Will you come see me every day, he asked. I swear I will, unless my husband forbids me. Then I'll sign the appeal, he cried. After a while they could talk again. Mrs. de Renal told Julienne that her priest had forced her to write the letter to Marquis de la Mole. What about Miss de la Mole? She asked. I've heard about this strange romance. It's only true on the surface, he replied. She is my wife, but she isn't my love. I feel for you what I should feel for God, she said. I don't think I will live long after you die. Julienne stood up and said, I will not sign the appeal unless you promise me that you will not take your life. You must live. You must take care of my son. Matilda will leave him with servants. I swear I will not take my life. Chapter 38 Facing the Death Mrs. de Renal returned to Besançon. My first duty is to you, she said, kissing him. I ran away from Verrières. No words could express the amount of Julien's love. Julien wanted to be a gentleman to Matilda, but every time his love for Mrs. de Renal was stronger. Matilda learned that Marquis de Crossenois died. Another man had made some bad jokes about Matilda, and the Marquis had challenged him to a duel. The other man won, and one of Paris's best men died at twenty-three years old. Poor Croissonois, Julien said. Now you must marry Mr. Deleuze. He's more ambitious, but he'll marry Julien Sorel's widow. A widow who has seen her lover prefer another woman. A woman that caused all our suffering. Matilda said. Matilda was jealous, but she loved her faithless lover even more. Julien, however, lived for Mrs. de Renal's love. He never thought about the future. The air in Julien's cell had become very bad. On the day Julien was told he would die, the countryside was full of bright sunshine. He was full of courage. 
He had never looked so handsome as he did when his head was about to fall. Everything happened simply and with no troubles. Before that day, Julien told Fouquet to take Matilda and Mrs. de Renal away. I'd like to rest, Julien said, in the mountains outside of Verrieres. Many times I stopped to rest there, and my heart was filled with ambition. Matilda returned to Fouquet's room. I want to see him, she said. Fouquet brought her to his body. She took Julien's head and kissed his forehead. Fouquet could not watch. Many priests went with the body to Julien's tomb. Matilda rode along in a carriage, carrying the head of the man she loved so much. They went to one of the highest mountains, and twenty priests said prayers for the dead. Alone with Fouquet, Matilda insisted on burying her lover's head alone. Mrs. de Renal kept her promise. She did not try to end her own life, but three days after Julien was guillotined, she died with a broken heart.